Welcome to Agents Growth Academy. My name is Jim Schubert and I hope you're ready to grow big or go home. Folks, I've got a super stupendous, fantastic, wonderfully amazing guest today named Charles Specht and I'm going to bring him in in just a second. But before I do, uh, and by the way, he's going to talk to you all about prospecting and appointment setting, which I think is going to be something right up your alley. Um, I want to talk about a uh, free download that I want you to go check out. Uh, if you go to agentsgrowthacademy.com forward slash value, uh, this is something that you can use that I've put together for you to get some ideas of how to add value to potential prospects, something we're going to talk about today, uh, before you even ask for anything in return. Because I think I've seen enough of you out there who are doing a good job of this and it makes a lot of sense. So I took some of your ideas put them into a cheat sheet for you to grab. Uh, just go to agentsgrowthacademy.com forward slash value and you're welcome. Um, my guest today is none other than Charles Specht. You know him best uh, by his methods for building a book of business from agent of record letters. Uh, as a sales coach, keynote speaker, and LinkedIn advisor, he teaches insurance agents how to quote less, win more often, and build a $1 million or more book of business through signed broker of record letters. Uh, he provides permission-based sales training to insurance agents on a global basis, teaching them how to prospect with integrity, persuade with transparency, and profit with victory. I love that. Charles, welcome to Agents Growth Academy, my friend. Hey, Jim, it's great to be here, man. I'm excited to, to have a conversation with you and hopefully bring a lot of quote unquote value to all of your <laughs> listeners. So, I love it, man. I'm excited about it. <laughs> you, you've got a great podcast going too and a whole brand around a million dollar producer. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us, you know, I'll give you the floor for a second to tell us a little bit about what that is um, yeah. so that folks, if they want to check you out, man, they should. Right. Well, I mean, you know, even in our kind of pre-chat, we talked a little bit about like branding and marketing and so forth. And so, you know, like the broker of record letter is a tool. It's not necessarily the end outcome, but it's something that I talk about a lot because yeah. it gets people to think, to discuss, to determine whether or not it's something that would work for them. Similarly, when I start talking about millionaire insurance producers, that the millionaire might actually like get people to sort of, you know, perk up, pay attention. But at the same yeah. time, that's not necessarily a goal that anybody needs to try and achieve, right? A million dollar book of business for an agent in South Dakota is probably not going to happen, right? Yeah. They don't need a million dollar book of business. <laughs> Whereas if you're in South, you know, uh, California, um, Los Angeles area, yeah, that probably is very doable. So it's just going to be different based upon each person. But hmm. the thing about it is that there's a very small percentage of insurance producers out there who are able to actually achieve a million dollar book of business, let alone a two or three or um, so far, the one I know that has the most is 12, a $12 million book of business. And that's commission, right? That's not wow. premium. So yeah. we're always talking commission and it's like yeah. something to actually shoot for. Yeah, That's really kind of what I focus on, which is why, you know, my uh, podcast is called Millionaire Insurance Producer, because we're trying to get people to be as successful as they possibly can. And a million dollars might be your, your goal, but maybe uh, two million is your goal. So it just yeah. kind of depends. That's awesome, man. I love it. And we'll put a link in the show notes to this and we'll have you um, talk about some links at the end of the show too. But uh, I'm curious. So we were talking off air a little bit about prospecting and appointment setting and how that plays into it. Because it's one thing to build your million dollar or more or whatever uh, your, your taste may be book of business. But how the heck do you even get in front of the right people? Um, so was there a pivotal moment for you or like an epiphany that was like, okay, I think I've got it figured out when it comes to prospecting and appointment setting. So my answer to that is no, there's never been a time. Um, <laughs> I don't have it figured out. Everything, you know, constantly changes. And so tactics can change based upon what things are happening out there. So when we talk about email marketing, well, you know, what, what, what might work today might not work three or four months from now. Yeah. You know, so the 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 end user continues to grow and mature and change and tactics can change. But when it comes down to it, there's a lot of things that are not tactical that, yeah. you know, will always work, if you will. But I think that I really began from a perspective of like trying to figure this out a little bit is that I understood 
if you can package something a different way, then it can get somebody to pay a little bit more attention. Mm. And so, you know, as we were kind of chatting earlier, I grabbed a book and it's this book called Tribes by Seth Godin. I don't know if you guys nice. are familiar with this, but it's uh, anything by Seth that he writes, I read and I read it multiple times. But he's the author of The book, Purple Cow, right? He is, yeah, which is Among right others. there on my, on my shelf as well. Nice. Um, but this particular book, page 35, is what changed my life. And it helped me to understand the difference between the status quo and doing something different. And this is what he says. It's, it's, it's short, so I'll just read it. Yeah. He's talking about the status quo, and he says this. Organizations that destroy the status quo win. Individuals who push their organizations, who inspire other individuals to change the rules, thrive. Again, we're back to leadership, which can come from anyone, anywhere in the organization. Then here's really the kicker. The status quo could be the first time that everyone knows, or could be the time that everyone knows it takes you to ship an order, or the commission rate that everyone knows an agent ought to be paid. The status quo might be the way everyone expects a product to be packaged, or the pricing model that everyone expect, accepts because it's been around so long. Whatever the status quo is, changing it gives you the opportunity to be remarkable. And so the whole idea of taking something that that you've always done that has become kind of like mundane, it's 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 sort of it's old, it's used, it's tired, everyone's kind of done it that way. If you yeah. can take it and repackage it and really just sort of destroy the status quo, you're going to get much further ahead of everybody else. And it's not so much like, oh, you know, we're a great agency. We've got really good people here. They're great at service. We've got wonderful carriers, markets, you know. That's you that. and everybody like, else. Yeah, everybody else, right? <laughs> the whole idea of that we're good at service doesn't make us better. That's the status mm. quo. We better yeah. be good at service. Otherwise, we need to get out of the insurance business. Yeah. And so we have to have something else that provides value. There again is that word, right? And mm. so it's not value that I think is value. Like if you are my prospect, Jim, I have to figure out what's going on in Jim's mind. I have to decide what is actually valuable to Jim because the problems that you have, the solution to that would be valuable. I might have a lot of ideas and solutions and so forth, but if they're not the solutions to your problems, then I will never win. And so yeah. I have to become really good at repackaging whatever it is that I want to, to put in front of you in a way that is going to provide the solution to the problem that's keeping you up at night, if you will. Yeah. And so that whole process, when it comes down to branding and marketing, prospecting, setting appointments, it all comes down to repackaging something that you have to offer in such a way that it causes the other people that we're, that we're talking to to think that's the solution to my problem. I and the more it. that we can become effective at that, the more broker record letters we receive, the more new clients we receive, the closer we come to become a millionaire insurance producer. As I say in New England, yes, sir. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me about some creative ways that you've seen producers package or repackage, as you're saying, uh, that that value that they're bringing. So you got people that are always saying, you know, service or this, that and the other. How are what are some ways you've seen that people mm -hmm. are repackaging that successfully? Right. So, you know, we just talked about some of the things that aren't special. Been in the business for this amount of time. We have these insurance carriers and we got great people. Like those are part of the insurance equation that are not special. Mm -hmm. That's just whatever it is. Stop yeah. talking about that because nobody cares. Right. <laughs> Your prospect doesn't care about that. They want to know what do you have for them. And so there's other things that we can take from a services standpoint. Now, this is going to be determining um based upon whatever the agent or agency has available to them. They sure. may not have a lot of services or they may have some other services that are really good. Yeah. Maybe they do workers' compensation claims management. Maybe they do um, certificate compliance and they'll review certificates from all of your subcontractors and things like that. So if you have an actual um, service that you provide that is specific to the um, type of clientele that you're going after, which we will kind of talk about micro niching potentially. If it really is a service that you provide that helps that micro niche, then we need to figure out how to market brand that, repackage it and so forth so that it's very attractive to that person. But what's really going to be above and beyond that um, is something that I call the micro niche sort of branding. Okay. Yeah. So that first part that we were just talking about, which is the service your insurance agency can offer, that can be enough. Okay, it can be enough to really get you going um, if it's good enough. 
if you can maybe get some testimonials, if you can actually see that it's providing what it's supposed to provide, and if you can figure out a way in which to repackage it. We'll talk maybe a little bit about that here. But yeah. really where I see most of the agents taking it to the next level is that they go much deeper into their micro niche specialization. That is the kind of prospect in which they go after. And then they create services to that industry rather than just um, insurance. Okay. Ooh. So it might be something like, uh, as an example, like let's say yeah. somebody wants to go after, um, you know, restaurants, local restaurants. And so maybe they can offer a um, social media campaign, a marketing campaign to help restaurants, you know, create a little bit more of a buzz out there with local social media in order to drive more people into the restaurant. That would be very helpful. In exchange for me becoming your insurance agency, we can actually put together a full-blown social media campaign for your restaurant that will increase your foot traffic by 17% per quarter, right? Uh, maybe we can create a, a training program to teach all of your waiters and waitresses how to do an upsell on the dessert menu, which is where most of the profit tends to be at. Um, there's lots of different things that we can help them with. You know, um, auto dealerships, you know, put together a sales training program for them. At the end of the day, insurance agents are salespeople. We should be able to do something like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I use an example, and I, I, I always kind of hesitate to use it, but it's just such a good one um, sure. that I want to use it. You know, <laughs> had an agent who a client who um, he just did transportation, and the biggest issue for um, companies that are truckers is they can't find new drivers, and so he had them find new drivers. He put together a Google Ads campaign on their website to help them actually find new drivers, and so it was something that he could use as a script when he was contacting them. And not only do we have something that could potentially help you with your insurance costs and drive down your insurance costs, but we also have a unique program to help truckers find new drivers. I'd like to come and talk with you on Tuesday to talk about not only how we help you in the insurance, but give you some information about how we can help you get more drivers. Does Tuesday at nine work for you? Right? So you just having that service can open yeah. up a lot more doors because it's those types of issues that actually keep your prospect up at night. It's not the insurance for the most part unless there's yeah. like a major issue. Like you can sure. save somebody, for example, 4% on their insurance, but that's just one small little line item on their entire expense report. But if you can also help somebody increase revenue, right? I mean, if I, if I ever got back into insurance sales, I would probably go after stores. I would probably think about construction, but maybe stores, furniture mm -hmm. stores, um, different things like that where you actually can sell things. I would just create a sales process where it's a training program where I actually teach all of their salespeople how to sell. I could probably teach people how to sell an extra bedroom set or an extra couch, whatever it is, per month. And how much additional revenue would that be to an organization? I will be able to do that in exchange for you, you know, uh, turning over your insurance to me and allowing me to also be your insurance agent. It is a service that I would provide. Um, it, there's there's a lot of different things that you can do, but what you really need to do is figure out the type of an account that you're going after. Figure out then what are their pains. Create the solutions to their pains. That's how you repackage these things. And it's brilliant. I'm glad you went there because I was going to ask you, I, I made note of what's their biggest issue, what's their biggest pain. And you're right, that, that's the the starting point to figuring that out, like what would you even provide them? Because I'm sure a lot of people are listening to this going, I don't like my niche. I have no idea what that would be. But you're right. Yeah. Talk to them. How would they find that out? What's the what's the best way for them to find out what their biggest pain is? Um, a couple of different things. One is you can definitely go to a trade association. Mm -hmm. So if it was, you know, Swimming pool contractors, you could go to the, the National Swimming Pool Contractors Trade Association, look at their website and see the different services that they provide there because that's who all their members are. And so you can yeah. see what some of those things are. Um, I would even like use it as part of maybe your initial prospecting strategy. Get a list, call the first 25 and say, hey, here's what we're doing. We're actually putting together services to help swimming pool contractors. And so I'm trying to find out the top three problems you have in your entire business, not insurance, but in your entire business. And we're gonna be put, putting together solutions to help you. What are some of the main problems that you have? I mean, not yeah. only is it something that you can do while you're prospecting, but it's also an information gathering during discovery. Sure. Um, but there's, you know, and then if you have clients, you can definitely contact them. Yeah. Uh, but again, just use it as part of prospecting. And, and that's interesting because what if somebody finds out, you know, you were talking about like creating um, uh, uh, kind of an educational seminar around how to upsell particular things. 
if that's not someone's superpower by nature, would you recommend that they either go learn it themselves or find someone who they can partner with? Or what, what would you recommend there? Yeah. And that's probably something that I hear a lot. Um, so for me, I spend a lot of time on social media, so I know how to do it. And that's only because I've just sort of forced myself to figure it out. Yeah. So if I was going to do that, I would probably be able to provide social media myself to, to a, an account. Okay. Yeah. But I know that most agents aren't like that. And that's what I hear. Like Charles, like I'm not going to be able to do that. And I don't want to do that. It's like, I totally yeah. get it. Yeah. Um, so to get back to your point is that if nothing else, part of your micro niche branding could be that you know what some of the major problems are. And so you bring in outside consultants to do that. What you provide is sort of a lunch and learn environment. Maybe we do an occasional once a month Zoom where we bring on these experts to be able to give this information directly to you. And that's going to be providing the value that they need over the course of the year. Brilliant. That way you can outsource it if you don't have that talent, but you know that that's their, their pain point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like, even as you like continue to create that, it it's like you, you create a suite of services that you don't have to provide yourself, yeah. but let's say you put together like, Hey, just, you know, we're going to do six lunch and learns over the course of the year. What's one every, one every month or every two months. And they're going to be about these six topics. And yeah. you already know that those are major problems that that particular industry deals with. Just by that alone, you become the obvious choice of which insurance agent to do business with, because yes. if they already see you as having answers to their, their own industry problems, they assume you've got the answers for the insurance side of it. And so you're like eliminating so much competition because you're focusing on the core problems that they have. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. And I think I've, I've said this before on, on my podcast and other videos that I put out is like, if you are the person providing the value out in the world for a particular group of people, when it comes time that they're ready to do something about their insurance problem, whatever that is, then you're going to be the natural person they go to first because you've mm -hmm. put yourself out there and, and you are already a solver of problems. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah. What's your definition of a micro niche? How is that different from just a niche or is that just your way of saying it? Right. Um, well, it's part of my branding, right? So I created that kind of idea a number of years ago, but it really just has the idea of just like going like deeper, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. there's three things I talk about thinking bigger, narrowing your focus and then consistent prospecting though. Like those three things alleviate everything, yeah. all your problems. But the idea of like a microscope is that you're really kind of looking down onto something. So, yeah. you know, uh, somebody might say, well, my niche is construction or my niche is agriculture. My niche is transportation. And those are industries. But to really like go like deeper, instead of saying, you know, I do transportation, it could be like I do local moving companies. I just do local moving and that's okay. your thing, right? Yeah. Or, you know, healthcare, you know, I only do physician groups. Physician groups is my thing. Yeah. So it can be like, it can be industry related, but there are times in which I help insurance agents put together a micro niche that has nothing to do with an industry. It has something to do with maybe a line of coverage. Okay. Maybe it has to do with a service their agency provides, right? Maybe they're just really good at helping companies lower um, debit mods. And so yeah. they're able to help them get their X mods lowered. Well, great. If that's what you're really good at, we can probably find 20 different high hazard industries, you know, and just find companies in those industries that, that you know, you've got the carriers for, and then you'll know, help them put in together the the services they need to lower the mod. And that becomes the thing that you focus on. So the yeah. micro niche doesn't necessarily have to be like micro industry. It okay. just needs to be small enough so that you can really get your hands around it. And so that when you're marketing and branding it out into the marketplace, people will instantly see what it is and they will know whether or not it's for them. If it's, if it's like too wishy-washy, if it's not clear, People will say, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's what I want. I don't need. And then they move on to the next thing and you're forgotten about. So yeah. really just having a sort of narrowed expectation about this is where I'm focusing my time. And when you do that, you tend to actually have much better results. Right. Because I also say that, you know, your typical insurance agent is not going to have thousands of clients. You might have 50, 100, 150. So you don't have yeah. to be all things to all people. You just need the you need to be the best to your 50. I right. It. Find yeah. your 50 as quickly as possible. And that's yeah. it. That makes sense. And actually, when you really niche down like that uh, to a, a micro level, we'll call it, I, I do. I, I think you tend to become an expert and more well known very, 
more quickly than you would if you were broader. And, mm-hmm. and not only that, I have to imagine that as you're doing your own research for what are their pain points, you've, and I, I learned this from Pat, do you know Pat Flynn, uh, yeah. e- expert online marketer? And he talks mm-hmm. about asking questions, whether it's through your, you know, email, um, uh, your email list that you're sending out or, you know, you're getting people on your, on your email list and then sending them emails and asking them kind of as they're going through your funnel, like what, what's your biggest challenge with X or this or that. And then listening to what they're saying, mm-hmm. using the same words, the same language, because as you start to offer whatever it is that you can provide as a value piece for them, uh, they hear you using the same language and they think, you know, he's a local, he, he gets us, he knows us, he's using the yeah. same terms we do that, and describing yeah. those pain points in the same way. I don't know if you, you know, I heard a story once about shepherds. I'm gonna tell you this story, shepherds and some sheep, right? Love it. So, you know, what I would hear from like the, the Middle East, even like today, but certainly from the ancient Middle East is that, you know, these shepherds at the end of the night, when they would come in, they would bring in their sheep and they would all put the sheep inside this big pen. Okay. So maybe like each shepherd, let's say like got 10 shepherds and they've each got 50 sheep. So they bring in all these sheep and now there's 500 inside this pen and they're just all in there. And that way they're, they're safe from the wolves at night. Well, every morning the shepherd would come in and they have their own unique whistle, right? Mm -hmm. So they would whistle something, you know, or they would say something. It would be like their particular call. And whenever they did that whistle, their 50 sheep knew that that was their shepherd. And then they would come to the door and they would follow that shepherd out, right? So the thing is, is that your marketing, your branding is your special whistle whistle, and that when you do it right, it's going to attract the people that you want to follow you. Right. But if you're always like doing like a different whistle, you're always kind of like following after something different. Um, You're not going to get that brand recognition. You're not going to have that loyalty and they're not going to follow you. Yeah. That was Excellent analogy, by the way. And I would expect nothing less from uh, a minister who, you know, is probably thinking in biblical terms too. And, and t- yep. yeah, definitely <laughs> thinking about that from a shepherd's perspective. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And yeah, I was sharing offline with you how James Jenkins had, had challenged me to really hone in on what this podcast is about. And uh-huh. um, once I took adv- his advice, I even started to have more fun. And then I start to really narrow in, you know, what this is about. It's branding, marketing, agency operations. I'm not here to talk about, you know, your workers comp mod and how you can get people to, it's not about that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason is I haven't written a look of insurance in probably eight, nine years. Um, So I'm not the guy you want to ask about that anyway. I'm, I'm busy running a larger insurance agency and I don't have time to, um, to, to, to do that. So I know yeah. where my talents lie. And I think that's something that I can, I can kind of visualize as you're talking about this, that people really need to think about what are your natural God-given talents? What are your passions? Is there something that you could potentially align around a niche that you already know has mm-hmm. problems with that? Like you were saying before with social media, digital marketing, if that happens to be one of your talents, maybe as you're searching for your niche, would you would you recommend to somebody to even look backwards, like deconstruct it that way to find yeah. the right niche? Or would you tell them, no, go find the niche you want, then find the problem? Or could yeah. it be both? So here's a little bit of a plug for a future digital course that I'm putting out probably in the next yes, couple of months. I, okay? We did not plan this, I swear. Right, I'm we so didn't plan it. Out this way. But plug the away. The thing that I probably get asked about most from potential clients, potential insurance agents that want to hire me, and then my current clients is, what should I go after? What should be my micro niche? How do you figure <laughs> one out, right? What's a profitable, what's not? Um, so I'm putting out a digital course on how to pick your most profitable micro niche. Um, there is definitely a system to it on things you look for and what you don't look for and you know what carriers you have access to and so forth. But you know, figuring it out alleviates so many problems, right? right? So you talk about that passion and so forth. Well, that's one aspect of like maybe how you can start putting together like a list doesn't mean it like any of those things are going to be on the list at the end because they might be great hobbies there's just no money in them right right Um, right. so it's just going to depend upon those things but when you for example you narrow down your your podcast to certain things that you have a passion about 
And what it does is it allows you to come up with the content more. You know exactly what some of the main issues are. You can, you, you can dial it in with your audience. Like everything just becomes easier when you micro niche, right? <laughs> and so if you're, if like your audience is too big, you know, you can talk about a lot of different things, but there's a lot of people that it is just not going to resonate with. Um, and I won't say who this person is, but it's a very well-known, um, person who's in the online marketing space, but she also has like a couple podcasts, like for other things. And her podcasts, I would say like over the last couple of years have been really good, but, um, have been watered down a bit from the standpoint, yeah. like, I really don't even know what her podcast is about anymore. And okay. I sort of lost, I lost interest just because yeah. Many of the topics, like I would, I would look at it like, wow, that one, I'm not interested in that one. I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in that one. And like, well, there's one about fashion. Like I'm definitely not interested in fashion. <laughs> and so there was like just stuff that would come up and like, I'm lost because I yeah. don't know what this is about any longer. And I think that happens to insurance agents all the time. And so if we just stay completely focused in one main area yeah. where we have that passion and we know the language, we know the problems, we know the people, we have the reputation, we know the you know, the carriers that are wanting to write it and so forth, the more that we can be really focused on that, the much more attractive we will be to people, hands down, you know, yeah. otherwise, you know, if, if there's nothing special about us, why would they choose us? That's the hard part. It's really hard to get appointments if the prospect doesn't see any value. Absolutely. If they don't see any differentiation, it's yeah. very difficult to get a broker of record letters because there's no reason why they should choose you if there's like really nothing of substance there. So yeah. the more that we can get focused, the larger accounts, you'll be able to write those. You'll get more clients more quickly and you'll get more signed BORs. Like everything just kind of works a little bit better when you're kind of micro niched. And it also, so it doesn't necessarily mean that an agent has to have just one. Yeah. You know, I think it's important for an agency mm -hmm. to have multiple but, you know, again, it just depends upon how many people you've got there. But there's no reason a single agent can't have two. Three is a challenge. But I would say pick two particular areas where you feel like these are profitable areas that mm -hmm. are completely different from one another. That way, yeah. if one thing happens in that industry, it's not going to impact the other parts. Right. And it doesn't mean that you won't write other business that comes across your desk. Sure. It just means that you're going to spend your time marketing and branding in your micro niche. And that's where the people are going to resonate with you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you're such a stud for being able to plug a, a product that you haven't even released yet. <laughs> Pretty impressed. Thanks, awesome. man. Yeah, I'll put you on I, the uh, email list, by the way, Jim. So you'll, you'll I love it. I love one. it. Do you have Do you have like a a web address to send them to for that already? Or are you still not yet? No, I'm in fact, like, I've just been waiting for like some projects to be done, and they got done this last week. So I'll be putting together um, all of that probably in the next two to three weeks. I'll do all the recordings and everything. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll make sure that we include it in the show notes because this episode probably won't go out for another month, almost maybe okay. a month and a half. We're I'll so have it figured out and I'll shoot it to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then we'll get you back on and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it, man. Uh, let's get into the rapid fire round. I think we got some really good, uh, really good value added from you already. I appreciate it. And I'll give you a chance to kind of wrap things up in a nice little bow here at the end. But um, one piece of technology or software you cannot live without. Try not Calendly. to see your cell phone. Yeah, my Calendly. Oh, um, yes. Because I work with so many different insurance agents, like I have, yeah, you know, a dozen to maybe twenty, you know, um, appointments every single day, and they get like rescheduled as people's, you know, yeah. stuff comes up, like. I remember I didn't have that. And I actually reached out to Brent Kelly, probably maybe I would say five years ago, something like that. And I said, Brent, what do you use? And then he <laughs> said, Calendly. I'm like, all right, I'm going to use it. So it's all Brent. Uh, but yeah. it really helped me over, over the course of time. Without it, I don't know exactly how I would, how I would um, you know, handle my day. That's actually something I want to, and I totally agree with you. I use, I use Acuity scheduling for this podcast. I think it's bought by Squarespace now, but I use Calendly for everything else in my agency. Um, I'm wondering, like, how would an insurance agent apply that to the scheduling? Because we talked about prospecting and appointment setting. I mean, I would think there's loads of ways that they could make it uh, take advantage of, of that for their appointment setting purposes. Yeah, I mean, they definitely could. And I, there's um, Calendly is getting a lot better, I think. And I think there's some things that are coming up in the future that are going to be super helpful. But yeah. You know, when you use it on your website, when you use it in your social media, you can really have your prospects 
you know, set up a 15 minute conversation on Zoom yeah. or just by telephone yeah. in order to speak to you about it and get free access to whatever it is that you're trying to you know, market to them. Yeah. Um, that they'll get it, but it's going to require, you know, a 15 minute conversation. They get to pick the time and so forth. So there's a lot of different things that you can use um, for that. And I, I think that's probably one of those pieces of technology that it's there. And even the people that use it a lot, like including myself, probably like don't even come close to using it for what we really could be using it for to bring in new clients. Yeah. Somebody does a really good job of it. David Carruthers, you know him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, David. Great guy. Who, yeah. who doesn't know David? Yeah. Um, yeah, David, David does a good job of that. Just, uh, actually, I think I'm recording with him at the end of this week on his show, but it, and that was the same thing. He was like, go get this link. And, and I was like, I bet he does that with his client, his prospective clients as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. Really brilliant. Um, what about one book you're reading right now or one that you've read recently that you just want to share with folks? Um, so I moved back in July of last year. So a little bit less than a year ago. Yeah. And we had to put everything in one U-Haul. And so I think I got rid of about 95% of all my books. No. And I kept, I kept, this was good because I had too many. Yeah. And so I kept probably <laughs> like, I don't know, 40 books yeah. that I'm like, yeah. these things are like timeless. Like I'm going to keep rereading these. And I've decided that for the most part, unless like something is amazing, I'm just not going to go and like read new books any longer. Like yeah. I don't need yeah. more in, I don't need more content. I just need to um, apply the content that I have. You know, so we talked about story brand and so forth. I mean, I think I've read that five times. I've highlighted it. I've done like so much with it. It's great. Yeah. But the yeah. book that I just happened to be reading like the last week and a half again, um, which is like, it's such a reminder to completely put your foot on the gas pedal. And it's the 10X rule by Grant Cardone. Um, mm -hmm. Just really helpful. You know, I yeah. read the, uh, the chapter again today on 10X goals, um, but it's really just... You know, if you want something that is going to push you, you have to have goals that push you. And it's yeah. like constantly just kind of pushing you outside of the status quo and outside of the comfort zone. So that's like one book that um, I've just been reading lately. Yeah, I love it. I was at a retreat uh, a couple of weeks ago with a guy named Tommy Breedlove. Um, he was a guest on the show, wrote a fantastic book called Legendary local here in Atlanta and uh, Grant Cardone's name got thrown around probably like 20 times over the <laughs> over the course of the retreat. So. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to go read that too. Uh, for all of our listeners, y'all know this, but I'll say it again. If you go to audibletrial.com forward slash grow big, if you like to listen to books on Audible, I don't know if you do, Charles. That's how I preview my books before I decide if I'm going to buy it and then mark it up with a pen. Okay. But but that's uh, that's a easy way to go get a free book from, from Audible and test it out. Audibletrial.com forward slash grow big. Um, what... What, what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Hmm. This is going to sound a little bit cliche, but it's not. Um, Hit me. The whole mindset of like thinking bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was actually talking with a client of mine, I think maybe a week or two ago. He's a very successful agent outside of uh, Atlanta. And yeah. you talked about it earlier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a very like substantial book of business. And I told him, I said, man, I remember back when I was like, 22, 23 years old. And I thought to myself, man, if I can just get a job for like $50,000 a year, like that would be great, you know? And I mentioned, I said, you know, now if I only made $50,000 a year, I would be like having to go to bankruptcy court. Like it's just not even right. close to like, yeah. you know, kind of where I'm at. Yeah. And it just sort of reminded me that everything that we sort of shoot for, we put our own sort of limitations on it. Uh, which is kind of like why the 10x you know book is i think really helpful is that we we can sometimes dream big but we don't think big and i don't think the issue like for me is like think big it's like think bigger that yeah. i literally feel that every single person can probably make 20 times more than what they're currently making if they would just actually implement the ideas that they've been thinking about over the course of months and years yeah. Instead of like thinking about it and just dabbling with it and sort of playing safe that, well, if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. No, if we go all in, I really feel that sky's the limit on what we can accomplish in so many areas of our lives. And so I would say to my younger self, Charles, think bigger. But then I would say, no, think bigger than that uh, and actually implement what you're what you're thinking about. So that's probably what I would say. Hopefully I would listen to myself, but unfortunately my younger <laughs> self didn't listen to many people, so it probably wouldn't have worked. That's beautiful. Do you know uh, Tommy Breedlove? 
Or have you heard of him? I don't know. Um, I'd love to introduce you to him. It, yeah, it'd be great. Like, the two of you would get along well. Yeah, I mean, that's I took away a lot of what you just said from the retreat that we uh, just did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And that was only part of it, but uh, that's a awesome advice, man. Fantastic yeah. advice. I wish I could go back and give myself the same advice, honestly. That's I know. Good. Yeah. Um, one, one trick, not, it's not a trick question. It's just a, it's just a question you might not have known unless, uh, you've listened to every episode. Um, if you had the choice right now between eating hot soup or gourmet hot chocolate and marshmallows, what would you choose? Soup or marshmallows and hot chocolate? Right now, considering that I'm hungry, I want some soup, but if I'm not hungry, I'm going with the hot chocolate all the time because <laughs> chocolate is my downfall 100 percent. i will okay. eat chocolate all day every day if at all possible but if you're offering me a cream-based soup i'm always going to eat that cream-based soup so it depends upon okay. what the soup's going to be okay uh well, like give me an idea of what kind of soup cream of uh broccoli love cream of broccoli i would cream eat that stuff broccoli. all day i yep. think we can hook you up with some of that i'm going to double check but okay. our friends at spoonful of comfort uh, we okay. have sent uh, a majority of our guests. Uh, some people choose the marshmallows and hot chocolate, but I'd love to send you some uh, some soup from Spoonful of Comfort. It it's, comes in a nice package. Bring it, man! There's, send that stuff some, over. I'll there, I'll take a video of me eating it, and I'll I'll oh, tag you on do. social media. That'd be awesome. Yeah, please do, man. Yeah, um, there's some great stuff in the package. I'm not even going to tell you about. You're going to love it, love it, love okay. it. Um, I'll make sure that I send enough for you and your four kids who are still in the house. Uh, I'm not going to send one to your fifth kid, but uh, <laughs> you'll just have to have him come home. <laughs> That's right. He's <laughs> in college. Some... So it is. Yep. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, they, we, they've done a fantastic job. They actually gave our, our uh, uh, we, we gave that to our staff last year instead of having a an in-person thing during COVID for employee right, appreciation. Yeah. Everybody loved it. It was so good. Yeah. So good. So, That's awesome. Yeah, man. Love it. Um. Charles, what is one piece, one, one final piece of advice for the audience based on what we talked about today or, or an actionable step for them? I think the biggest actionable step that I really ever see or, or really kind of speak to the average person, if you will, is that you have to ask for what you want because normally people don't know what you want. And certainly when it comes down to the prospects that we speak to, they don't know what to do. Okay. So when you're speaking to insurance agents, your insured has no idea what's in their best interest. They don't know how to get a quote. They don't know what you do behind the scenes. They don't know what's in their best interest for them. Like they really don't have a clue. And so we have to really, you know, hold their hand and lead them down the path that we want them to go. And at the end of the path is that you will never get a new client unless they are willing to fire whoever they're doing business with. We have to kind of lead them down that path. And at the end of the day, it requires asking for the business. So, yeah. you know, really, I, I use a hashtag, ask for the sale. I use that hashtag a lot just because it's true. In fact, yeah. um, I think Ryan Hanley, like, you know, mentioned that to me like some years back. I'm like, all right, Ryan, I'm stealing that hashtag, ask for the sale. And uh, <laughs> it's mine. He can't use it anymore. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thank you so much. Charles, thank you for being a guest on the show. It's been fantastic. Uh, stick around for one second for me afterwards. But uh yeah, it's been been a pleasure, man. I all right, man. Can't, can't believe I I had the the millionaire producer on my show. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, yeah, it's great to be with you and your people, Jim. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, everybody. Until next time, grow big or go home.